Hello and welcome. I'm going to go ahead and start my stream. It is uh, Cybersecurity Awareness News and Info. It's actually episode 12 and it is January 26th. My old marquee still flashed the old date and number, but we'll correct that, hopefully. Um, what I have today is the usual. Let's switch to that frame. So here's uh, my social media contacts. I am LornMJ on YouTube. You can find me in the same name, LornMJ. Twitch, same name, LornMJ. On Twitter, you can find me as LMJ underscore OU. Uh, my email for business inquiries is LornMJ at gmail.com. My schedule is I do Thursdays, and I do about one hour. Sometimes it's a little longer, and sometimes it's a little shorter. But we try to go for an hour. What I do is I take listener feedback and talk about that, if any. And then I uh, talk about the news. I pick a few news items that are worthy of mention and talk about them in the cybersecurity sense and uh, lessons learned. And then I also do a part called a how-to instructional, which I happen to have this week. I had to skip that the last few weeks, but I have it this week. And then finally, I have a website tool of the week of something you can use yourself and be able to enjoy uh, some kind of little free tool or whatever that has helped me and might help you. So to get started, let's go with the listener feedback part. On the listener feedback, I have heard from um, a sponsor, actually, uh, someone who wanted to go ahead and provide a sponsorship. I am still in negotiations, so uh, we won't be talking about that yet. I won't reveal who it is. I can't talk about it uh, very much at all. So uh, just that I did receive it. Uh, I didn't see anything else going on in... Uh, and Twitch activity or uh, YouTube. As a matter of fact, I don't think I checked YouTube. We should probably look at YouTube, shouldn't we? That's easy enough to do. Let me just do that real quick. And what I can do is I can look for any sort of feedback that came in. Uh, it's pretty easy to find. Um, and that is it, looks like. Uh, no. Okay. So that's good. Let's skip that part then, and we'll go right into the news. Now in the news, uh, we're going to start out with this story here. Let me show it. Um, here we go. Uh, so we're going to talk about the first story. Uh, we're actually going to skip one of these stories. I decided just a few minutes ago that I'm not going to follow that story anymore. I wanted to give you an update on a story, but I'm not going to do it. Uh, there's that new R key. Thank you very much. It is episode 12. So... Uh, that off as done and then the first story is going to be MailChimp says it was hacked again uh, this is from Zach Whitaker of TechCrunch uh, dozens of computers dozens of customers computer data or data was exposed this is now make it, making the second time on January 11th an internal tool was used inside of MailChimp the organization they used um, a compromised employee accounts that were gained through that internal tool to gain access to data on 133 MailChimp accounts. Uh, those people have been notified, uh, those customers. Uh, one customer in particular is uh, WooCommerce, and they received a notification from MailChimp. That notification said that their names, web addresses, and email addresses, uh, but not passwords, or other data was taken, so not passwords. Same thing happened last August when a social engineering attack was successful. So that time it was social engineering. This one it was. This time it was a internal tool was compromised, and that internal tool became multiple employee accounts that were compromised, and then it became larger. Uh, so the cloud giant DigitalOcean confirmed that its account on Mailchimp was compromised by the incident, and they took the opportunity to harshly criticize MailChimp in handling that breach. There's nothing like another tech company harshly criticizing another tech company. Uh, MailChimp said that they have implemented security measures to enhance security, but have not said what those were. Uh, so being very silent about that. Now, take note of this. After the August breach, so this was that was the first breach, uh, their security enhancement was to fire their CISO. 
well, well, at least right after August, it was announced that the CISO was departing. So, so I wonder, well, are these enhanced security measures just firing the CISO? And if so, are we going to fire the current one? I wonder how many put that in their tool belt of security tools. Let's see, we have AI we can turn on this problem, or we have detection software deployed, or we have the contracts with providers that we can start looking through and have lawyers going after them, or we can just fire our CISO. Hmm. It kind of makes me think of those old teenage horror films where there are a bunch of scary noises outside, and one of the tools we have on hand, well, let's see, uh, we have a hatchet, we have a machete, we have a pistol, we have a pellet gun. Ah, let's take that flashlight. I'm pretty sure it has dying batteries in it. That'll do. Let's take that. So that's um, how we solve our problems. If you're um, a chimp that delivers email. So let's move on to the next story. Um, this story is kind of an old story, but I wanted to highlight it for a new reason. And I don't know if this reason was ever covered when it came out, so I'm going to just pull back into history and I'm going to show this to you because I think it's kind of interesting. Um, this is one is titled Mystery Signal from a Helicopter by Una Reyesainen, which I'm totally butchering that. I'm sure you can find her information at windytan.com. Uh, that's a personal website for this person, I believe. Uh, they are a data analyst or a signals analyst, and um, apparently the story goes that uh, she was looking at YouTube, and it suggested something for her to listen to or to watch. And it was a um, it was a um, broadcast that came from a helicopter. I guess a person was uh, flying over Kansas City doing a normal thing. I don't know traffic, something like that. And this sound analyst, uh, noise analyst or signals analyst, could hear something in the background noise. So she took that and then did some tweaking of the signal and using her signals analyst and self-proclaimed geek tools, she noticed that noise as having a pulse effect. So she used some tools on it, came up with the analog to digital signal that was being sent out, and it seemed to be telemetry data. So we don't know whether it was coming from the helicopter, or could have been the navigation computer on the helicopter, or maybe it was something else that has a GPS on it, maybe the camera. Um, or could be a phone. I don't. I don't know. Whatever. Whatever. Whatever was doing it was uh, broadcasting out audibly the telemetry data. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and play it so you can hear it. This is what it sounds like. Yeah, that's right, Mark. Northbound, uh, getting ready to come up to about... Okay, so you, you hear it, right? So you hear that regular noise, that beeping, that uh, constant uh, repeating of a signal, it seems like, the wavelength, of course. So um, what you could hear there is the telemetry data going out. So what she did was she turned this telemetry data into data and was able to trace the helicopter's path through the city because it was telemetry data. So um, she goes on to create a map of where the, uh, of appar apparently, uh, where the helicopter flew. So she um, was able to figure out where exactly, you know, it flew and what it did. And, of course, the coordinates and everything. So uh, I realize that this is an old article. It isn't news. Um, and But it highlights a, a, an important privacy principle. Uh, something that's important to me is you really need to be careful what exactly you are broadcasting or leaking from any sort of communications equipment. Uh, what if this wasn't a uh, chopper doing a run over a city, but rather something else? For example, what if it was a law enforcement helicopter trying to run down a criminal? Or perhaps it was a stealth helicopter picking up important asset covertly. Um, well, it wouldn't be so covert, would it? Uh, you would be able to track the helicopter real time what if this wasn't a news person aboard a na but a person aboard navy one the president's hel personal helicopter and this sound came over their live broadcast well if so you could track the president's exact current route in real time so that would be 
a bad thing. Uh, this is why you have people like this, people like her, uh, people like me that do this sort of signals analysis, or really any analysis person, uh, watching broadcasts, doing air quality checks before broadcasting. It'd be very important to be able to nail down what are these, what are these, what are these signals from? When you hear something like that, that's a digital signal. Everybody, everybody that's in IT can recognize that. They can hear that. Anybody who's heard, uh, you know, a modem synchronize can hear those noises and say that's digital. Uh, I mean, it's auditory, of course, so it's a, so it's an analog signal that you're listening to. But you're listening to a digital signal being converted to analog, and that's what it sounds like. We've all heard that when you've heard a modem start to connect. So uh, that's what that is. Uh, you need to figure out what that is. What could you be broadcasting? So it's fairly academic for this person, the sig signals analyst, to convert this into an exact path that this chopper took. Um, that, in this particular case, it was um, innocuous, right? But what if it wasn't? So let's move to the next story. We're going to go with um, something Apple's done. So let's talk about this. Um, this it was a bit old. I think this goes back to January 24th, so it's a couple of days old. But um, Apple is celebrating Data Privacy Week. So let's talk about this. So the story is Apple marks Data Privacy Week with in-store privacy training and more by Johnny Evans of Computer World. If you are an Apple customer of any sort, uh, maybe you like their phones, maybe you like their computers, maybe you like their iPads, uh, whatever, or perhaps you are a um, non-techy family member who you know needs some privacy training, uh, and they are an Apple customer. Well, this might be good news. So this is some th something you can do for them. You can send them to this and say, uh, well, here's what you're going to learn. Uh, so they put this together. What is Apple doing here exactly? Well, they're trying to help people understand privacy and what it means for a person. A lot of people just not chalk it up to, well, I'm not valuable, so my data isn't valuable. But you need to understand that, yes, you are valuable. You are a uh, consumer in the United States. We're called whales for a specific reason, and that is because we are considerably wealthier than the average person in any other country. So just our residual wealth can mean life or death or can fund um, activities in another country. So we need to be very careful about that. Even our private uh, funds that we don't track, uh, you know, are, are important to other people. So what has Apple done? Well, they've published an amusing short film, which I won't, I won't play. You can, you can play it on your own. But um, it's a video that uh, explains how privacy is related to data and how it's gathered and how it can be abused and how you, as an iPhone user, can protect yourself. It also does, let's see, I'm, re just, I'm basically just reading this. I'm not, not reading it verbatim, but they announced this series of half-hour taking charge of your privacy on iPhone that are be these little sessions that they cover that are at the Apple stores worldwide where you will have explained to you what these privacy protections are on your iPhone and what they are. Like, uh, for example, the app tracking transparency tool. You'll be able to know what that is, how it works. You can help a person through it. Uh, you can learn it yourself if you're the techie of your family. The other thing, last thing that they're going to, that this company is doing is they're in the process of rolling out iOS 16.3, which uh, you could already get as of, um, well, I know I did it a couple of days ago, but yeah, it's probably available even before that, where, uh, which gives iCloud users a way to encrypt your data that they store on Apple service to hide that information from prying eyes. So there you go. Uh, basically, this is sort of free training, and why not take advantage of it? And why not help uh, your family to be more engaged with cybersecurity and privacy? Um, you can even, I'm not even sure if it's, I'm assuming they're going to check to make sure that you're an Apple customer, but what if you're not? What if you just walk in and say, hey, I'd like to learn more about privacy? I don't know that they'll necessarily reject you. I, it does say customer, so maybe you need to be a customer. Or maybe someone in your group needs to be a customer. But I would say probably worthy checking out, especially since they talk a lot about privacy. So let's see. Let's see if they're willing to put something together for you. And, and free training, um, that could be very good. It could be very good. It could be just what the doctor ordered in a lot of cases. So let's keep going. 
and talk about the next case. This one, uh, let's go back to the top here. It is titled, How Case Western Reserve University Responded to the Cybersecurity Insurance Crisis. Uh, this is from EDGECOS. So, we all know the story. Ransomware is bad, and ransomware is increasing. Uh, thus, in a direct relationship, the losses from ransomware attacks are shooting up at a logarithmic scale. So, uh, they're going to infinity and beyond. And this is what the insurance companies are going to do about it. Um, well, see... I've talked about this before, uh, but insurance companies, they technically will insure anything, right? Uh, as long as your budget allows it. So now they're rethinking that budget part and saying, well, we're going to insure you. However, your in, your risk has gone up so much that we're going to, to, in some cases, quadruple or more your premiums to cover your cybersecurity risk. So sure, we'll cover you against ransomware, but your cost just shot up by four times. Four times. So 400% is what you're paying as opposed to last year. Also, it may they may renegotiate what exactly is covered. So it's like what happened here in Oklahoma, and I think I mentioned this, where um, you, know, you may get a new roof because you had some hail and because you had uh, some damage from a tornado, but these days uh, you're not getting that anymore. You're not getting a complete roof repla replacement. You look down in the details and it no longer covers a complete roof replacement. In other words, we'll take care of your roof. We'll check it. We'll make sure that it, we try to get our 10 years out of it that we need. But we're going to get that 10 years out. So that roof replacement that you thought you were getting every 2 or 3 years, not going to happen. So in this case, just because you say you're covered for ransomware, maybe you're not. In other words, you paid for the insurance, you paid a lot for it, but, turns out, you didn't follow one of their guidelines, or one person out of your 100 employees failed to follow the guidelines that we put out as an insurance company. And for that reason, we are not qualifying you for payment on this incident. How would you like that news? Historically, the help you need uh, when it comes to uh, a ransomware attack or a cyber attack of any sort is you need help doing things like notifying your customers, setting up a call center, offering people theft protection, ID theft protection, uh, being able to send out letters in uh, mass, you know, handling people who call in with questions. Today, though, ransomware attacks are multi painful, pain pointed. They have many pain points. They have the initial attack, which of course brings down resources, damages websites, damages whatever. Um, it causes many problems. Uh, it could cause things like business interruption, uh, that which could be you know lack of payment. So in other words, that website was how you got paid. Well, you're not getting paid because it's down. And then there's of course the ransom payment, if any, if you've decided uh, you know to unlock the encrypted systems. You could possibly be put on the hook for a second or third payment or there could be extra fees uh, because of you know the stolen data in other words uh, they could negotiate with you and say well okay you know for so many thousands of dollars we'll go ahead and restore this however we're going to leak it out to the um, world that this happened but we won't if you pay this extra fee you know things of that nature uh, come up there are also of course ongoing legal reputational costs you know, recovering from from that um, there's also the untenable I would say or probably not very well tenable uh, loss that you have of customers that you've lost to a to a competitor because you got hacked uh, that of course could be in there too in your reputational costs Apparently, with all this counted, the new average cost of a ransomware attack, specifically on a higher education entity, is $1.42 million. So, that is what this article is about. 
universities, of course, are multifaceted. Uh, they have different areas that have different types of policies applied to them. For example, they have areas in the university where they take payment cards, where you can pay your bill, the purse are. Um, you, you can, you know, the holder of the purse, the carrier of the purse, you know, the place where you go to pay your bill. Uh, there could be, um, you know, uh, food courts and such, you know, that need a payment card standards to apply to them uh, on a specific network that you're allowed them on or whatever. You could also have uh, HIPAA areas where you have personal data that is part of a clinic that you operate, maybe a student clinic. There are also, of course, FERPA, which applies to student data, those laws and policies. Of course, there's all kinds of different industry standards, different standards bodies. There's also different laws that apply to each of these areas. This is why you need cybersecurity people that are skilled not in just one. In other words, a HIPAA expert. You need a person that is an expert in all of those types of areas if you work at a university. And of course, these audits that they get uh, are not as simple as, for example, a bank. A bank could say, yes, we issue laptops, and yes, we issued exactly this many laptops, and so this many laptops all have antivirus on them, and they all are the same of the same operating system, and they all are the same version. And of course, we use a VPN on all of them, and we, we require it, and you can't change anything on the laptop. But uh, universities are not able to do that. And so these audits that are performed, or these initial questionnaires, or initial forms you fill out, when you go with a particular cybersecurity insurance, some poor IT person, this admin, is left trying to explain uh, you know, the answer to a question on this form, or this answer in an audit of you know, why exactly this firewall rule is applied here but not everywhere, or it's only in this one place. You, know, you, you end up uh, answering these questions in an essay form, and each, qu each question gets answered in an essay form because this poor IT admin is left to try to explain these things. So it is not cut and dry. It is very uh, multifaceted, very complicated for a university to tackle this. Thus, the higher cost. So um, once again, these costs are going up and insurance is raking it in. You know, you could always do something, which I think this article actually talked about, which was to do something called self-insure. Self-insure is kind of, uh, the idea of that is uh, that you put enough money aside that you can help yourself out of this problem. So in other words, if uh, it requires $1.42 million for, an insur for the uh, university to crawl out of this problem, well, then the university would want to put aside $1.4 million dollars uh, in a bank account and not touch it until a cybersecurity incident happened. And then they could access it. Uh, they could follow their own rules. They don't need an insurance company to look at them and audit them and decide whether they're going to pay or not. They can simply use the funds because they're the master of their own funds. So uh, in all cases, I would favor that. Even if we could do that uh, for our cars or our homes, that would be the best way to go, right? Because that money is our money. We can put it into a, ba a savings account and earn interest on it rather than paying it slowly and in small increments to a company that is taking off the top and making money off of us. So, uh, basically, it's, uh, it's as the last word of this title suggests, it is a crisis. I agree. So let's go with story five that I have. And this is a problem that happened. Let's go to the top here. Uh, it is called U.S. Airline Accidentally Exposes No Fly List on an Unsecured Server by David Covucci and Michael Thalen of the Daily Dot. So, a uh, short story here is that there was a file called nofly.csv excuse me which is a uh, text file and that text file uh, could easily be scraped from a search engine uh, it turns out this this list 
uh, was obtained by a person who used a complex, serious, deep hacking style tools known as a search engine to find this file. And this file contains a subset of people who are on a list of those not allowed to fly due to their involvement or association with groups of terrorists. There are 1.5 million entries in total, so that must have been a fairly long file. It has the names, birth dates, aliases, as well as common misspellings of the names and aliases. So this is a, a who's who of the terrorist world, with notable people from many groups. Many groups, including IRA members. However, the Swiss hacker who found this list uh, pointedly remarked how the list is highly Arabic and Russian. In other words, the list contains many names that are Arabic or Russian sounding. Not sure what you're expecting exactly when you look at this data. I mean, the data is the data. It doesn't, it doesn't have a prejudice. Data is just data. In the most honest sense, anyway. So the server that hosted this file has been taken down, of course, and the explanation that followed was that the server was used for development, which is in layman's terms means that it's a case where they were using real data to perform tests on servers and equipment that they hadn't put in production yet. So you should never do that. Uh, one of the first lessons we can learn here, quickly and easily, is that you should never use real data on your development environment. You should make up a bunch of data or just use garbage. Uh, you can find sources of data. There are people that you can pay, actually, to make fake data for you. So uh, use that if you can. Even if it's a very small, or if you, if you have to repeat the same name many times, whatever you have to do to, whatever you're testing, you know, find a way to test it without real data. So that would be one very important lesson learned, is to never use real data on your development environment. By its definition, that is untested or lightly tested set of conditions that is currently being worked on, right? That's why you call it a development. You wouldn't want real data in there anyway. You should not expose your test environment or your quality control environment or your dev, dev environment anyway. That goes without saying. But if they do get exposed, at least they were filled with fake inf information rather than real data. At some point, of course, in your, mi your migration process, in your software development process, you would be uh, looking to load real data. You would, you would delete the p test data and put in real data into your development environment. But that would be right before, as in the day of operation, or the night before operation, that is performed only after rigorous testing, you know, the night before that you make a development environment available as your production environment. Another lesson that we will surely soon forget, right? It happens. Uh, the next story, I have rethought, and I don't know if I want to really cover it. Uh, it was about the Taylor Swift issue, and I decided it really isn't in the cybersecurity realm. At first it was, because I was concerned about how it would work out. But... Uh, you know, as far as the overloading of the problem, the denial of service that happened uh, with regard to buying tickets. But it's it's out of that realm now. It's more in the um, realm of CEOs getting called to Congress to answer for their mistakes and why this is a monopoly. Uh, so it's, it's far away from cybersecurity at this point. So I've decided I'm going to go ahead and skip that. So let's go to our next part. Uh, that is all the news. So we're going to go to the, the next part. I call this part the how-to instructional part, and this is where we're going to basically kind of talk about a section of cybersecurity that, say, you're learning or you're uh, looking to get recertified and you'd like credits or points. I'd like to include this so that my entire broadcast can be included as a potential training so that you and I can both uh, learn a little bit more about security. Now, I am uh, a certified information system security professional, so that means that I uh, am a CISSP trained um, member, and I continue to maintain that certification. So that means I hold to all the aspects of the training and the principles of that certification. 
So one of the principles that we teach in that certification is the identification of vulnerable vulnerabilities and threats. So that is a very important aspect of CISSP training. So let's uh, let's walk through it a little bit and talk about it. Uh, at the moment, I'm going to just put up this graphic, but I'm going to talk about the graphic a little later. So let me go ahead and put the graphic up. But I just want you to look at it and be able to read it, digest it while I talk. So uh, let's first off, let's get some gl glossary down. Uh, first thing is vulnerability. Well, vulnerability, of course, is a weakness in a system or its design. Uh, vulnerabilities obviously increase risk. Uh, they must be identified and classified and a risk analysis performed on them uh, once they're found. Uh, vulnerability just naturally is a flaw, right? It's usually a type of flaw and their types could be categorized, di categorized different ways. In the uh, CISSP training material, there are different ways we classify it. Uh, for example, one thing we call it is design errors. There could be an error in the design of a product or uh, device or process. There are also software vulnerabilities. So um, um, it could be operating system or application that is, uh, you know, it has a bug in it. There could also be weaknesses inherent in the technology or the protocol. So, for example, the DNS protocol is very important on the Internet, and there could be a known weakness inside that protocol that perhaps lead, lends it to be a vector to be attacked. There are also hardware vulnerabilities, and, and those would be vulnerabilities that are just inherent in the hardware. So whatever device you've purchased, for example, a phone, that phone, because of its uh, was being... Uh, a, a part of its manufacturing process it was designed and has a hardware vulnerability in it. So that would be classified as a hardware vulnerability. Uh, there's also mis misconfiguration. Uh, this happens a lot and is often confused with human error, but it can also be a distribution problem as well because uh, many times something is distributed in a certain way or it's sold to the customer in a certain way where it is inherently weak. For example, think about uh, how we used to buy our Wi-Fi routers. And those Wi-Fi routers didn't have anything turned on. They didn't have any security turned on. They were just completely open. So anyone could connect to them and get into your network. Well, things have changed. Um, now you buy a Wi-Fi router, and the first thing it's going to walk you through is turning on your security. It will be pretty much a must. You must turn on the security. It, it won't work otherwise. So it kind of forces you to... Uh, make those configuration steps and to configure yourself correctly. However, there's always on top of that the human error of, well, I tried to secure it properly, but I mistyped something, or I left something open, or I left something obvious, or I used the IP address as the password. I mean, something like that. You know, I thought, I thought that that was supposed to be where I typed in the password, but instead I typed in the IP address, because that's I thought that was supposed to be where I typed the IP address. You know, that could be some simple thing like that. There are also, of course, um, out, ex, outside external type things like a malicious software introduction. So there could be someone that downloaded something malicious and is running it. Uh, could be an inside attack. Uh, there also could be a problem with, uh, given you know, there could be an, an employee that's that's against the uh, the organization, but they 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 could have physical access. Right, they could have physical access to the resources that they're attacking, uh, so that's a problem. That's also considered a, a classification. So, in summary, it's it's design errors, software vulnerabilities, protocol weaknesses, hardware vulnerabilities, misconfiguration could include human error, and then malicious software and physical access. So, threats are in their own class. Um, they are related to vulnerabilities because a vulnerability doesn't necessarily equate to a threat um, because there could be someone that takes advantage of that vulnerability and that becomes a threat. But then we could close the vulnerability and then there's no threat. So it uh, depends on how you look at it. But they are of their own class because it could mean the possibility of an attack and it of course represents a potential danger to an asset. So what do we do? with things like this. So this is the reason I put this graphic up in front of you. Is I want you to digest it. Is that um, this graphic is has nothing to do 
with information technology. It has nothing to do with uh, cybersecurity. I took this from uh, a risk analysis done on uh, physical hazards where people can be hurt. So it's more along the lines of an OSHA or a NIOSH. Uh, I think I'm saying that correctly. Some of their standards where they try to protect workers from physical harm. So that's what this graphic is from. And we employ the same principles in information technology and cybersecurity. We employ the same principles here, where uh, instead of say, okay, there's a hazard to human life here, let's do the first thing, which is at the top, which is the most effective, which is to physically remove the hazard. So that's what we do in information technology as well. Is So we have this vulnerability that has come to light. What do we do? Well, we can we remove it? Can we simply remove it? In other words, can we just um, not do that anymore? Um, so could we just turn it off? Well, if we just turn it off, we're no longer vulnerable. So there you go, right? Uh, what if you can't remove it? Okay, well, we drop down and go to our less effective means of mitigation, which is to replace the problem, right? So what we're going to do is we're going to, instead of having this vulnerable device we're going to purchase a different one from a different hardware manufacturer or we're going to we're going to go ahead and replace the process that we used to use and we're going to replace it with this different process which gives us the same result so we could do that we could do a substitution we could also uh, do an isolation now this what this would do is is you would take people away from the hazard uh, so a person could get hurt if they're standing there but what we're going to do is we're going to change the fact that they can stand there right we're going to make sure that they can't stand there we're going to put guards up in place where people can't go. So that's the idea in the safety. So in risk management uh, for information technology, we would just say, well, we're going to we're going to put something around it so that people can no longer get at the vulnerability. So it's no longer accessible. We're going to put a firewall rule in place or something of that nature. Uh, the next step, of course, which is less effective is to engineer our way around the hazard, right? So um, you could do that with information technology. You could say, well, let's uh, let's take that problem and let's remove that piece of the code. You know, we'll go into the code and we'll just say, only allow that piece of code to run if we're being contacted from somebody from this particular address, you know? So we could say, well, that administrative portal is only accessible from this station. We know that there's a vulnerability, but it's only if you can access that station. So we're going to engineer a way where that only that station can be accessed by certain people. You know, so that's sort of engineering your way around the vulnerability. And then, of course, there is the one of the least effective, which is the administrative control, which is to just make a make a policy to say, hey, don't do this. <laughs> so. Uh, you can do that in information technology. You can just say, hey, don't do this. Um, you could set up a consequence. For example, if you're caught doing this, well, then you will be terminated or you will suffer the consequences. And, of course, that could happen in the real world where you could put a sign up, right, uh, where don't do this, don't go here. But you're not physically preventing people from going there. So, in other words, they're going to suffer the consequences because they ignored the administrative control, which is a sign. Uh, so that's why that does that. Now, as far as PPE, PPE is protect personal protective equipment. So this is like the the things you put on, the um, goggles, the protective goggles, the protective hat, hard hat, gloves. Uh, make sure you wear clothing that uh, protects you from something you know, protects you from whatever you're working with. Say you're working with acid, or you're working with a, with a tool that has a spinning blade. So you'd, you'd wear gloves, or you'd wear uh, maybe a an apron, you know, maybe a leather apron over your legs or whatever. Uh, you know, protect yourself from sparks or whatever it is. So this is the least effective. In other words, if you could just have somebody never perform that job, at the top, well, then there's no way they could be in a hazard. But if you have to have somebody do this job and it has to have sparks flying off of it, well then at least put that person 
in protective equipment. And that is the best thing to do. So how do you translate this into information technology? Well, if we have to have that vulnerability exist, well, then we can do everything we can to prevent people from accessing it, right? We can we can make sure that something, something is watching it, right? Um, actually, NIST helps us out here because uh, NIST, N-I-S-T, is the uh, organization that helps with, with risk management if you're an enterprise. So what they do is they have you do things like you categorize an information system. You have to say, well, this information system handles credit card data, so it is financially important. And then you do what's called a, you select a baseline security controls. You say, okay, only, only transactional data comes in or out. Nothing else does. And then you do supplementary security controls where you perform a risk assessment and say, well, let's supplement it with this, you know, firewall rules that prevent people from accessing it. Uh, then you can document these security controls, put them in a plan, right? Put them, make sure that someone there knows that uh, this has been done a certain way to prevent a certain problem. You know, you document it. You would, of course, constantly assess the security controls for their effectiveness to make sure they worked after you implement them. And then you would, of course, op authorize only people that need to be in this particular place. So that would be like you're putting a single person in charge of it, or two people. Maybe you're putting two people there and saying two people can access this, but only these two people. So they must uh, authorize themselves first. They must authenticate themselves, like sliding a card. And so you know it's them. And of course, nothing else, you can monitor the safety control, right? Like you can put a machine on it that does nothing but logs activity, right? So you can look at this as a, as a negotiation table, right? So on one side of the table, you have vulnerability and risk, problems, hackers. And on the other side, you have controls, right? The things you deal with. So you, can, you prevent what you can using preventative controls. So you reduce the chance of the error happening, maybe making two people look at or approve a transaction before allowing it through, something of that nature. That's a preventative control. You prevent a problem by having two people look at it and approve it. They both have to sign off on it. Another thing is a detective control. So you, you have a detective control, which is a knob that you can turn, which is a process that you put in place to monitor a vulnerability or potential attack vector and report in real time anything that happens. So if things... If somebody starts jiggling the locks on the building, you know, it'll cause an alarm to go off. Or you have a security camera on a door, or anyone going out in and out the door gets logged. You can see. You have a, uh, perhaps a, um, a slide, uh, a card, key card slide on that door. So now you've logged who has entered the building in and out. Of course, you can issue badges, uh, you know, those are only good as long as people understand the administrative controls, right? Like, you know that this badge is yours, right? And if you hand it to another person, you're going to be fired. You know, that sort of thing. Uh, you also have corrective controls. Corrective controls are things like you did an audit. And you... Hold on. Hold on a second. And we're back. Sorry about that. So these corrective controls, like say you did an audit and you found a, pro a problem, well then you're going to put measures in place that corrects it, right? So that's a corrective control. You've corrected the problem. And so now you just need to continue to audit, make sure that that corrective control worked. So it's the same as these pr safety principles. Can you remove the danger? Well, remove it. Can you do something else? Well, change it out. Substitute it. 
do we really need to do this? Can you change the danger so that a person needs to take a training course or interact with a sign or a door that warns them of possible problems before letting the person pass? Well, that reduces the danger too. At the bottom of the list, you'll notice that uh, you can put up notices. You can put up signs. You can say, so you have a spill on the floor, right? Clean it up so fast that no one even noticed, right? You remove the danger. Put people around it and block people from stepping onto it. So now you've put a corrective control, right? So you can put a sign up or you could even, um, you know, if you have to, shut down the whole floor. Don't allow anyone on that floor because of that spill until someone gets to where they can clean up the spill. I mean, you can you can do all these kind of things. You know, think outside the box. Take these principles and then apply them to whatever service you're working with. Do you do you need to do you need to run this web server 24 hours a day? Well, most websites do. But is there really a need? You know, you can think outside the box and say, "Well, I'm only going to make this accessible Monday through Friday." You know, so no one should be here after work ever. So I'm going to go ahead and shut all these internal services down so that no one can access them. That'll keep uh, people from being, you know, coming in late at night and causing problems, right? So, I mean, it could. Uh, you just have to think outside the box and you have to think about what's good in your environment and what makes sense in your environment. Can we check daily for vulnerabilities? Uh, can we scan our own systems? You know, can we take everything down and scan our own systems and then see? I mean, we do that anyway, right? We're so hopefully we're scanning for viruses and things of that nature. We're doing backups. Who's going to monitor these access? Who's going to read the logs? Who's going to take the logs and just sort of assess what's going on in the logs? Like, perform some analysis on those logs. Well, um, that's part of the thinking with risk analysis. And hopefully your risk analysis person, your cybersecurity person, is doing exactly that. Uh, with that, that ends our instructive process. So let's look at the next part. Uh, I like to call this part the website or tool of the week. So here is um, where I try to think of something that's useful just on a daily basis. So, you know, you might find this tool useful or not, you know, something you may have never heard of. Uh, hopefully it will help you. So what I've chosen today is something I've come across. Um, let's say that you are reading your email and of course you see a link in an email that is possibly illegitimate, possibly suspicious, you don't know. Well, of course what we do, what we're told to do, right, is to, uh, to hover over the link, right? We hover over the link and it shows us down in like the status bar what what give, you know what the real URL is at the bottom, right? And then we can tell, oh, that that looks suspicious or not, right? Well, um, sure, you can do that, but you could also get the link, right? You can put it in your in your paste buffer. You can just copy the link, right? Right click on it and say copy link, and then you can go to this website. It's called Fish Tank, P H I S H T A N K dot org, Fish Tank org and you can put the link in here and then press the button is it a fish and what you'll get is you'll get an analysis on that link to see if it is a fraudulent attempt to make um, you to make off with your personal data so uh, people can submit things they can uh, verify submissions of other people uh, you can see what people are putting in uh, it's a it's a nice tool that, um, you know, just a like cursory check of things. Hopefully, as an enterprise person, you know, you probably have already had a tool, already read your email, and already switch out your links in your email to something else. So if you're a customer of, say, of Proofpoint, then you already experience that. And in which case, looking at the, U the real URL is impossible. In other words, uh, you hover over the link and it, changes it to a proof point link so it makes no sense to you so you can't really tell whether it's legit or not so if you click on it then proof point you're trusting proof point to help you understand whether it's uh, whether it's fishy or not so 
So this is a decent way to be able to tell, you know, is that link really suspicious or not? So who puts this on? Well, it's the same people that put on, um, you, perhaps you've heard of it. It's called OpenDNS.com. OpenDNS is a place where you can actually point to to get DNS results, a DNS service, a free DNS service. And what it'll do is it will um, give you DNS, but it will check to make sure that you're not being fished so that you're being sent to a site that is vulnerable or a site that is suspicious. You can even set up your own free account at OpenDNS.com, just like you can here. And you can, you can even limit what you will see. For example, you can log in and say, well, uh, I'd like to change so that I'm never presented with anything that is malware, but also never presented anything that is uh, social media. In other words, I want to completely stay off social media or I want to stay off gambling. So you can actually do that. You can actually cut off those so that they can't be shown to you. So you'll get an error page. You'll be sent to an error page that says that's out of your you know, policy, against policy. So OpenDNS will do this for you for free if you're a home person. They'll do it for one IP address. Um, if you purchase uh, the OpenDNS, it's called Umbrella now, and it's from Cisco, just like this place. Uh, it's, it's also from Cisco. So it's the same people that make this. Uh, and they're basically just trying to fight against the same problem. And they use it in their analysis and matrix to improve all their products. So uh, a win-win, if you ask me. So let's do some administrative last final things, which is not listed, but I want to handle some administrative matters. Um, as I said before, I have been contacted about a sponsorship. I am interested in looking into sponsorships. However, I just want to make it clear that I have a set limit of time that I will give to ads or sponsorships that is non-negotiable. And I am also limiting what types of sponsorships I will give. For example, I would consider it unethical to promote a specific antivirus product or a specific VPN service. I would never want that to come back to me in a way where the reputation of that particular vendor compromises my person or my ethics. Uh, specifically, the sponsorship that came in is uh, for a food distribution company. And I am continuing to negotiate at this point. So don't be surprised if you do see something like that. Uh, and that, uh, in particular, you know, being food, is unrelated to information technology and unrelated to cybersecurity. So that's, that's kind of what I like. Uh, I will make it very clear when a sponsorship has been obtained, and I will also uh, use talking points from that vendor. And I'll make it clear that I'm using talking points from the vendor uh, rather than my own talking points. So you'll be able to easily tell the difference between ideas that come out of my head and ideas that have come out of the head of a, a vendor that I'm dealing with. Uh, for right now, we're not we're still not doing it. I've This is a free service that I'm providing to the world at this point and I'm not putting any ads in it um, except, you know, my own social media, uh, of course. But um, at some point I may, and I am open to the consideration of it, but it will have to be with extreme scrutiny. Uh, I am not liberal about it, and I would rather it be free service, continue to be a free service that I will just produce rather than have uh, anything that lowers my reputation, even potentially. So... Uh, I'll just say that up front as an administrative matter. With that, I wish you all well, uh, good health to you, and we'll see you next time.